Welcome to Notorious Minds, where we examine those that have altered destinies and changed human history by M.R. Parks. Warning, the following video contains violent content, graphic images, and descriptions which may be considered disturbing to some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. If you have not done so already, please consider subscribing to this channel. Please click the notification bell and you will be notified every time a new video is released. Journey with us as we look at a case from the 1980s titled A Child's Nightmare, The Story of Diane Downs. On Thursday, May 19, 1983, a cherry red Nissan Pulsar smashes into the emergency room parking lot at 10.48 p.m. As a mother driving the car screams for help, my kids have been shot. Three small children fight for their lives and young Christy, a mere eight years old, may be the only one who can shed some light on what has happened. Elizabeth Diane Fredrickson was born in Phoenix, Arizona to her father Wes Fredrickson, postal worker, and her mother Willa Dean Fredrickson, Phoenix housewife. Diane was born on August 7, 1955. Diane would reveal that her father Wes worked while Willa Dean stayed home tending to the house and the children, which including teaching Diane and her sister Kathy how to be good housewives. On Sunday, the entire clan went to church. That all changed when Willa Dean went to work night when Diane was 12 years old. According to Diane, that was when her father began molesting her a secret she would keep until she shared it with her future husband. Diane was a good to exceptional student all throughout her schooling. She was a reserved and shy child until she turned 14 and became a compulsive talker. Never popular in elementary or high school, a fact not helped by her parents' insistence that she wear skirts below the knee, bobby socks, sturdy loafers, and cut her long hair short at a time when girls were wearing mini skirts and boots with long straight hair. She graduated from Moon Valley High School in Phoenix, Arizona, where she met her future husband, Steve Downs. Steve seemed like a godsend to her when she met him at 15, seven months older than Diane and attending the same high school. Dark hair Steve was even at 16 years old, filled with a swagger and confidence that many females, including older women, found hard to resist. Diane and Steve dated throughout the remainder of high school and only parted when Steve joined the Navy in June of 1972. Diane graduated high school a semester earlier and headed to Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College in Orange, California, where she planned to study as a missionary and then switched to pre-med. Her college career came to a screaming halt barely before it got started when she was expelled for promiscuity. Although Diane would later say that she had taken the fall for another girl. So she returned home to her parents in Arizona. Diane and Steve Downs married on November of 1973, only a week after Wes Fredrickson, armed with a shotgun, stormed Steve's house when Diane didn't return home after a date and demanded that Steve either marry Diane or send her back home. It was not an auspicious start to a successful marriage, nor was the date with another woman Steve insisted on keeping two weeks after his wedding, claiming he had asked the girl out a month before and therefore had to honor it. Over the course of what would be an eight-year marriage, Steve and Diane had three children together. The first daughter, Christy Ann, was born on October 7, 1974. A little over a year later, Diane gave birth to her second child, Cheryl Lynn, January 10, 1976. Arguments over money consumed their days while Steve's accusations of Diane being unfaithful comprised their nights. After eight years of marriage, they, dis they divorced in 1981, about a year after the birth of her third child, a son named Stephen Danny Downs. Danny was not Steve's biological child. She had gotten a vasectomy after Cheryl's birth. Diane had had an affair with one of his co-workers, resulting in a pregnancy. But Steve gave the baby his name and accepted him as his son. Infidelity plagued their marriage on both sides, as well as Diane being a less than concerned mother at times. And the relationship finally combusted in 1981. Diane was not a good mother, 
You see, Diane loves the feeling of being pregnant and giving birth, but once the child is born, she tends to neglect. When Diane Downs was 25 years old, she often enlisted Christy Downs to watch over, over the younger siblings or left them at their father's house so that she could go find a new lover. Witnesses would report that she left the children unattended for hours after school. Many times her children had been witnessed by neighbors sitting on the porch and waiting for their mother to get home after school. Soon after Diane's divorce, she becomes pregnant again. Diane was paid $10,000 by a couple that was desperate to have a child to be their surrogate mother. During that time in history, it was very rare to be a surrogate mother. Diane had a baby girl on May 8, 1982, which she gave to the couple. Downs repeated the process in February of 1983. So Diane gained notoriety for a newspaper for being a surrogate mother which fed her narcissism. You see, Diane used her role as a mother as a form of attention. She loved being in the limelight. For the next two years while working at the Chandler, Arizona post office as a postal worker, Diane worked her way sexually through many of the male postal employees, the majority of them married. Her parents, Wes and Willa Dean, had relocated to Oregon, and in April of 1983, Diane transferred from Chandler to the Cottage Grove Post Office about 20 miles outside of Springfield, Oregon. Late in the afternoon on May 19, 1983, at a pleasant 75 degrees, Diane Downs takes her beautiful children on a car ride. They were headed to a town in a rural area called Marcola, only 12 miles from their home. Diane decided to go visit a co-worker named Heather Pollard, who lived on Sunderman Road in Marcola, who expressed to her previously about wanting to own a horse. Diane came across a flyer that she thought Heather would be interested in a flyer on adopting horses. Young Cheryl, only seven years old, was in the front passenger seat. Danny, the toddler, was sitting in the back seat behind his mother, and Christy was sitting behind her sister in the back on the right. After visiting her co-worker, Heather, they stayed at Heather's house for approximately 20 minutes while her children had time to pet the horse on the farm. You see, her co-worker had already purchased a horse, so Diane talked with her friend and then left around 9.15 p.m. In the middle of a rural area where houses are few and far between, instead of going directly home, Diane would later say she did a little sightseeing, something her and her children loved to do. Not sure how much you can see at that time of night in a rural area. She then turned back towards Springfield after her children fell asleep. She was on Old Mohawk Road. The song by Duran Duran called Hungry Like a Wolf was playing on the radio. When Diane got in the car that day, she had a .22 caliber Ruger pistol in the trunk. She pulled over and exited the car, walked to the rear and opened the trunk. Slowly pulling out the Ruger .22 semi-automatic pistol, she then walked back to the driver's side of the car leaned in on the seat and from six inches away fired the pistol at her daughter Cheryl on the front seat. The bullet entered the small child's back and exited out of her sternum. The bullet landed on the floor in the front seat of the car. As Cheryl fell out of the car trying to escape her own mother on the right side of the car, Diane Downs leans over the seat and fires at her again. The bullet lodges in her lower back. Diane then turns toward the back seat and shoots her son Danny in the back, most likely as he's trying to flee from the one that's supposed to protect him. Then she turns the pistol on her daughter Christy, shooting her in the chest, shooting her three times. As Christy is trying to protect herself, one of the bullets hits her left hand and exits through the base of her thumb. She then gets in the car and takes her children to the hospital. The other two children lay in the back seat, critically wounded. Little Cheryl, lying near the wheel well, is struggling to breathe. In order to get away with this diabolical plan and to keep suspicion off of herself, 
Diane shoots herself in the left forearm. Then she pulls from the trunk a large piece of cloth she planted there to wrap around her wounded arm. Then Diane gets back in the car and drove six miles to Mackenzie Willamette Medical Center. If Diane had driven to the hospital at top speed, she would have made it there in eight minutes. But realizing that her children are still alive, she drove much slower. So slowly, in fact, that she held up traffic. Her children are literally bleeding to death, and this woman is doing five miles an hour. Not even fast enough to make the needle on the speedometer rise. And we know she's doing five miles an hour because witnesses behind her are trying to figure out why is this woman driving so slow. And because it was a one lane winding road, these people had to follow her all the way down the road. What is interesting about this is that there was a family traveling on the road that night and they saw a red sports car. The red sports car with Arizona plates. And the eight-year-old child in the car with his family said, are all Arizona cars red? So later that family remembered that they were following Diane Downs' red sports car and testified to that. Diane Downs then pulled into the Springfield Hospital 30 minutes after she had shot her children at 10.48 p.m. Now remember, she was only eight minutes away from the hospital, but it took her 30 minutes to get there. When she gets to the hospital, she screams to alert the personnel, my kids have been shot. Nothing had prepared the staff for the drama that unfolded at their literal medical center doorstep at approximately 10.48 p.m. No warning had come until the red late model Nissan bearing Arizona plates careened into the emergency drop-off. The small night shift all heard it. A quiet night in the ER was not to be. The ER's 4 p.m. to midnight shift consisted only of four people, Dr. John Mackey, physician in charge, and two nurses, Rose Martin and Shelby Day, were on duty that night. The car was small, foreign, and shiny red. Thanks to the outdoor fluorescent lighting, it was nearly impossible to see inside the car. Diane Downs, wearing jeans and a plaid shirt, stood outside the car. Although pale, she wasn't hysterical or crying and appeared to be in control. Somebody just shot my kids, she told the woman. Nurse Rosie opened the right passenger door to the car and in the back seat behind the front passenger seat saw a girl with long brown hair wearing maroon corduroy slacks and a multicolored t-shirt that was soaked with blood. Next to her was a tiny blonde-headed boy, barely more than a toddler, who was crying and gasping for air. His shirt, too, was covered in blood. Rosie scooped up the child closest to her, the little girl, and ordered Judy to call a cold blue, a page for all available personnel to get to the ER. Shelby had run around to the car's driver's side and attempted to release the driver's seat to get the little boy out of the back. Diane standing there mentioned to her that the seat lever was on the side, but she did nothing else to assist them. Dr. Mackey rushed past Diane and Shelby to scoop up the little boy and run inside with him. Shelby turned to follow him and Diane motioned back to the car, telling her that Cheryl was on the floor and hadn't moved at all. Peering back in the car, Shelby's heart jumped into her throat as she realized there was yet another child in the car, a little girl who had been lying face down on the floorboard in the front, almost underneath the dashboard. She picked up the child and ran up into the trauma room where the two other children were being frantically worked on. The code Judy had put out summoned every available hand on deck, whether it was doctors, nurses, x-ray technicians, or therapists. Judy was the administrative person. Even the hospital's maintenance man ran for blood units, propped doors open, and did whatever he could to assist. 
Dr. David Miller, a pediatrician, was leaving Mackenzie Willamette late that night as delays had pushed his rounds later and later. He was walking to the parking lot when he heard the commotion and children and shooting. Without hesitation, he ran to the ER. Dr. George Foster was a pediatric surgeon on staff at the Sacred Heart Hospital in Eugene. Hearing the crisis, he raced to Mackenzie Willamette. Dr. Stephen Wilhite, certified thoracic laparoscopic vascular surgeon in the area had just pulled in his driveway when his beeper went off with the code from the hospital. Normally it took him 20 minutes to get from his home to Mackenzie Willamette. On that evening on May 19th, doing, doing 80 miles per hour, Dr. Wilhite made it there in eight minutes. All three children were in critical condition. The little girl, Cheryl, that Nurse Shelby brought in was stripped of her blue cord jeans, blue Levi's belt, and purple and white striped shirt, leaving her only in green shorts she wore in place of underwear. Nurse Shelby worked feverishly to suction the little girl's throat to clear it of blood clots that were blocking her airway but each time she removed one, she found another underneath. The clots were thick and coagulated, indicating that the child was not actively breathing. Life pack leaves were placed on the child's chest, but there was no electrical impulse for it to register anything other than a flat line. Dr. Mackey stepped away from Christy and Danny to attempt to intubate this child, a procedure that only elicited blood. Mackie turned her over and noted two bullet holes in her back, one over her right shoulder blade and one just below her left shoulder blade. Mackie called a time of death and returned to the two children who were barely breathing. The still surviving girl, Christy, has suffered three small caliber bullet wounds. Two were to her left chest. One was a through and through near the base of her left thumb. Although her pupils had reacted to light when first brought in, Dr. Miller could actually see the life draining from her eyes. She gave out only labored gas as if she was taking her last breaths, and she had no blood pressure. For all intents and purposes, she had begun the process of dying. An endotracheal tube was inserted in her throat to force air into her lungs, but the oxygen was in expanding her chest. A portable chest x-ray revealed a massive hemorrhage in her left lung. On top of that, her right lung was collapsing. Her heartbeat was faltering, only sporadic beating, and her skin beginning to turn a frightening shade of cyanotic blue. Her heart stopped as Dr. Wilhite flew into the ER. She had no blood pressure, no pulse, and her eyes were fixed and dilated. Miller and Wilhite refused to lose this patient. Sodium bicarb was pushed into her body, hoping to encourage her heart to beat. Wilhite grabbed a chest tube and with no need for anesthetic at this point, plunged it directly into her left lung through her skin and chest wall. This tube filled quickly with bright red blood. A second tube that Dr. Wilhite plunged into her right lung showed no blood and a very little air. It had collapsed in on itself. Fortunately, the little girl's veins and arteries had not collapsed. A CVP line was inserted and O negative blood was quickly infused. And then, to the amazement of all, her heart began to flutter. Her pupils began to react. Her blood pressure rose. She had cheated death, but wasn't out of the woods yet. Her situation was still very serious. Her right lung had expanded, but her left lung was still filled with blood. As quickly as she was being infused with fresh blood, it was leaking into her left lung. This little girl wouldn't be stable enough for surgery until 11.45 p.m. When she was wheeled to the operating room with doctors Wilhite and Miller alongside her, the respiratory therapist Bob Gully breathing for her through the trach tube. The little blonde-headed Danny needed comforting. He was so young. Medical personnel guessed three. He couldn't understand why he struggled to breathe. Dr. Mackey had begun resuscitation immediately upon the child's arrival to the trauma room. A CVP line was inserted in his right jugular vein 
and a solution was started that would keep the veins open and ready for medication or a transfusion. Once his green and white hockey shirt and Oshkosh Bagash jeans were removed, Dr. Mackey and Dr. Farsted noted a small entry wound less than an inch to the right of his spinal column. Black powder from the gun's barrel was present around the wound, indicating it was a contact wound. That evil witch put the gun right up to his back. A chest tube was inserted on his left side. His left lung was suffering with diminished breath sound. Blood and trapped air gushed out and a small lung immediately expanded. This allowed the little boy to breathe easier, but he continued to cry. He was not out of immediate danger, but the bullet had come so close to his spinal cord that the doctors worried that he might be paralyzed below the mid chest. The little girl, Christy, that had miraculously come back from the grips of death survived her surgery. The damaged lobe of her left lung was cut away and she had required a complete blood transfusion, but her blood pressure was normal following completion of the procedure, and she woke up relatively quickly. The endotracheal tube, although frightened, she responded to the doctors and nurses who spoke to her. The responsibility for Diane, who had driven the children to the ER, had fallen to Judy Patterson. Diane told Judy that the children were hers, eight-year-old Christy, seven-year-old Cheryl, and three-year-old Danny. Her name, she told Judy, was Elizabeth Diane Down, but she went by Diane. Over the next eight hours, Diane would be joined by her sister and three brothers. On May 20th, 1983, Fred Hughey, county prosecutor, had been with the Lane County Prosecutor's Office for seven and a half years and had been promised the next homicide case. Along with investigators Paul Alton, Fred went to see Christy and Danny in the ICU of Mackenzie Willamette Medical Center. So covered in bandages, tubes, and monitored leads that, on, that only her long hair, eyes, and eyebrows were visible, Fred stood at the foot of Christy's bed to look at the grievously injured child. Christy locked eyes with him, and all at once, an unemotional prosecutor had tears rolling down his cheek. In that moment, Fred Hughey became an unofficial guardian for Christy and Danny. Fred Hughey sensed something foul almost immediately. In preparation for what the DA knew would eventually lead to a murder trial, it was Hughey's job to follow the revelations of the case as they surfaced. As far as Hughey quickly ascertained, the fetus of something evil had taken form of that rural roadway in Lane County. Whatever happened Thursday night, the facts began to come to light in almost suspicious manner and unlike those explained by the mother. Hughie, relatively new to the DA's investigative squad, nevertheless knew mischief when he saw it, and he saw it first in the faces of two perplexed, scary youngsters strapped to tubes and cords in a lowly lit hospital room. Never one for sentiment, even he was surprised when he felt tears rolling down his cheeks as he gazed upon Christy and Danny down. And when he heard from Paul Alton the reaction of Christy when she had seen her mother for the first time since the shooting, he knew it was not the normal reaction of any child who in pain and surrounded by foreign faces would have been overjoyed to see one person in their life to rekindle their spirit. Hughie ordered a round the clock guard for the children. He also commissioned a child psychologist to remain at Christie's side during the day to build up a trust that the child may confide in her. Meanwhile, Dr. Ed Wilson perf performed an autopsy on Cheryl Downs. Cheryl had been shot twice. Either of the wounds would have been fatal. The first shot was near contact, entering just below her left shoulder blade. In its deadly path, the bullet had damaged a rib, her left lung, her aorta, and her trachea. The second shot was also close, this one entering just over the right shoulder blade. The second bullet had damaged a rib, her right lung, before coming to rest just below her left shoulder. Dr. Wilson felt that Cheryl wouldn't have lived long enough after the first shot to do much of anything about it. The second shot was entirely unnecessary. Cheryl's body was cremated and her ashes were scattered in Arizona. 
Judy Patterson had called the police at 10.40 p.m. that day after Diane uttered, he shot my kids. Within eight minutes, the first officer arrived at the hospital. Both Springfield and Lane County police responded. To them, she exacted the tale of an ambush and an odd description of the assailant. Reacting to the story, the departments issued an emergency watch on the city and county roads, fearing that there might be a madman roaming the outskirts of Springfield, its lanes and byways, squads drew into action and the area described by Diane as a point of attack. In the vicinity of Marcola and Old Mohawk Road, a desolate spot became the center of a manhunt. Upon hearing from Diane that the shooter had happened outside of Springfield city limits, he called the Lane County Sheriff's Office. It was 11.15 p.m. that day when three Lane County detectives showed up, Dick Tracy, Doug Walsh, and Roy Pond, expecting to find a domestic dispute that ended with gunfire and children slightly wounded in the crossfire. They were shocked to find Cheryl Downs dead, Christy Downs in critical condition, and Danny Downs facing potential permanent paralysis. With the children so grievously injured, the detectives expected that their mother, too, would be in dire straits. Diane also had been shot. Her left arm was wrapped in a bright beach towel from her wrist to her elbow to slow the flow of blood. Diane was then informed of Cheryl's death just before the detectives walked in. Welch and Tracy followed her into an x-ray room and as she had her arm checked, Diane re Diane's response was impossible to read, but once in the room, she alternated between a flat demeanor and laughing inappropriately. The detectives knew that shock and grief were expressed in a variety of different ways in different people. She was informed that Christy was in critical condition and in surgery and provided a description of a bullet's pathway in Danny that could result in paralysis. Diane's question was only to inquire as to whether the bullet had missed Danny's heart. Detectives who spoke with her in a private room at the medical center were equally surprised at her attitude. One investigator, a sharp, keen-witted veteran of the county's homicide squad, who was nicknamed Dick Tracy, found her unlike other women who he had encountered after similar cases. In fact, he later defined her as a very rational, considering what she had undergone. Together with his partner on the case detective, Doug Welsh, who also found Diane Downs too stoic for a mother whose entire family was just shot. Tracy conducted an interview to garner some personal background on the mother and her children, as well as to begin building a chronology of events leading up to the shooting. To that point, they had determined that the bullets that had been fired at the kids were .22 caliber shot from either a handgun or a rifle. Detectives suspected a handgun. Powder burns on the children's skin indicated that the weapon had been fired at an extremely close proximity, especially close on the deceased girl, Cheryl, who had been in the front seat. Blood splayed across the car's seats, doors, and windows, and elsewhere indicated that the, murder, that the murderer had discharged the gun from the left on the driver's side, which agreed with Diane's story claiming the intruder had reached into the window to shoot her children. About the mother herself, the detectives learned that she, that she was 27 years old, was a male woman for the U.S. Postal Service and worked the Cottage Grove Division. Having previously been a letter carrier in Chandler, Arizona, she recently divorced from a man named Steve Downs and from obtaining a work transfer relocated to Oregon to be near her parents, Willa and Wes Fredrickson. The Fredricksons were former Arizonians who had moved to Oregon years earlier. Wes Fredrickson was also a post office employee. Diane sketched for her interviewers a quick history of the evening. According to Diane, she and her children had eaten a fast dinner at home, then left their small duplex home at 1352 Q Street in Springfield, bound for a co-worker's home on rustic Sunderman Road. The friend, Heather Pollard, 
had told Diane a few days earlier at the workplace that she was thinking about buying a horse. And Diane had an ad in a paper about, about horse adoptions that she figured Heather would appreciate seeing. Not knowing Heather's phone number, they weren't intimate friends, Diane decided to bring the advertisement to her place of residence. The drive, she explained, offered a good opportunity to get the kids out of the stale house for a couple of hours. All of a sudden, she's concerned about her kid. On the way home, after a brief chat with Heather and her husband, Diane thought that she would cut through Old Mohawk Road to the main highway. She thought it might be fun to go sightseeing. The kids enjoyed watching the moon from the unlit countryside. It was then after she turned onto, onto Old Mohawk Road that she spotted the man. He was standing in the center of the gravel road, signaling as if he needed help. She described the man as a white male in his late 20s, about 5 feet 9 inches tall, 150 to 170 pounds, dark haired, a shaggy wavy cut, and, a, and stubble of a beard. He wore a Levi's jacket and an off-color t-shirt. She stopped and got out of the car. It was then that the stranger produced a pistol from under his jacket and demanded that she turn over her car keys and her automobile. She refused, but in retaliation, he reached past her in through the driver's window and opened fire on her family. When he tried to reach for her car keys, she motioned her hand to appear that she had thrown them into the woods and then pushed the assailant out the way. But as she stepped back into her car, he fired one more time at her, striking her arm. Slamming on the gas pedal of her Nissan, she sped off in a way. The children were hurt. She could see that and thought only one thing. I have to get my children to the medical center. The officer's mind had wandered a moment while Diane spoke. He had read the doctor's report of the treatment of Diane's arm injury, a single bullet shot to her left forearm. It split into two as it shattered the radius and then exited, leaving two small wounds. As she related her getaway from the man on the road, how the bullet struck her arm, he couldn't help thinking that the place where she was wounded is the exact same place other killers have shot themselves in order to appear innocent. But he was not and would not pass judgment until the evidence was in, and that would not be here for some time. Before the interview ended, Diane agreed to sign a search warrant on her home. She admitted she owned a 38 caliber pistol, which she kept for protection on her delivery route, and a 22 caliber rifle for home safety, but both were unused. One lay cold, hidden under rags in her trunk, and the other collected dust on a shelf in her home. Meanwhile, police around the hospital were busy. In the driveway, they prepared the red Nissan Pulsar with the Arizona license plates for transporting to the crime lab for further investigation. Behind ER, Detective Ray Poole collected evidentiary blood clothing removed from all three children. All personnel assigned to this particular homicide knew without a doubt the weekend ahead would mean little leisure time and a lot of pounding on doors, question asking and rattling of brain cells in order to figure out this heartbreaking mystery. Friday morning, plainclothesmen checked with Heather Pilar to ensure Diane and her kids had visited them the previous evening as Diane had said. Mrs. Pilar confirmed the visitation as well as the reason for it. Under the supervision of detectives Tracy and Kurt Well, state troopers searched Diane's Springco residence, requisitioning several items, including a diary that they had found, the aforementioned rifle, a Glenfield 22 caliber, located where Diane had said, and a box of 22 caliber shells, same as those taken from the children's bodies. One particular item, however, interested Dick Tracy, a photo of a young man in a beard that took up space on top of Diane's television with other pictures of Diane. Tracy was cognizant of the fact that Diane had made a phone call to a man in Arizona, a former boyfriend, supposedly not long after arriving at the medical center before she knew the state of her children, before alerting her ex-husband and the father of the children, she acted as if compelled to call this man in Arizona. Detective Dick Tracy studied the photo of the man, wondered if he was looking at the object of Diane's urgent phone call. When Diane Downs went into her daughter's hospital room, 
Several nurses and an investigator were at her bedside. Those in the room noted as she squeezed her daughter's hand, murmuring, I love you, that the child's eyes peeking from above an oxygen mask took on a gaze of fear when spotting her mother approaching. He happened to glance at the heart monitor, the pulse. When Diane came in, he noticed that Christy's heart was beating at 104 times a minute. When Diane took hold of her hand, the rate jumped to 147. Doubt in the mother's story was building. Over the coming days, her version of what happened that night changed slightly. Her placement of the killer when he fired the gun altered, as did her actions in the face of the supposed gunman. Steve Downs, Diane's ex-husband in Arizona, Welsh learned that Diane owned three, not two weapons. One was a 22 caliber handgun, which Diane did not mention. He admitted that he and Diane were still friends, but that their occasional phone conversation never extended beyond the kids' health and education. He seemed genuinely upset with the bad news and sincerely hopeful that Christy and Danny would pull through. He made immediate plans to fly to Oregon to see them. Detective Welch asked Steve Downs if he knew who the Arizona man might be and the former spouse. And Steve, not surprised by the question, replied that he must mean the married guy with whom Diane had been having a torrid affair for some time before leaving Arizona. He was a postal worker at Chandler, and whatever happened in their love affair, it finally severed. The man returned to his understanding wife, but Diane still seemed to carry a torch for him. Her infatuation with this married man was maniacal, but he didn't seem the type to leave a doting wife for a woman with three growing hungry kids. When Detective Welch asked about the weapons the couple had owned and which ones Diane had taken with her to Oregon, Downs told him that Diane had a 22 rifle, a 38 revolver, and a 22 Ruger Mark IV nine-shot semi-automatic pistol. She used to practice her shooting at the local Chandler gun range. Then Detective Welch felt he had to ask the obvious. Steve, would your ex-wife harm your kids in order to get this married man back? No way, shaking his head. She loves those kids. When questioned afterwards, Diane denied that she still owned a 22 caliber Ruger. Diane proved to be a very willing and talkative witness, informing Welch and Tracy that there are eight levels of intelligence and I'm at level seven. Diane explained to the detectives again. As she told the story to the detective sitting in the hospital room before an orthopedic treatment for her arm, her arm was broken but with no nerve or tendon damage. Diane asked the detective about her car. She wanted to know if any of the bullets damaged her car, if her car was okay. She had just bought it in February. A bolo at that time had been issued. A be on the lookout was put out for the man Diane had described. Now seeing that Miss Diane Downs injuries were minor and that she seemed to be in an unusual state of calmness. In fact she seemed in full control of her senses unlike other mothers would who would have been in that situation. The police asked that she come with them, describe as best she could what had happened. To do a videotape reenactment, sitting in the car is Elizabeth Diane Downs. Detectives started to suspect Diane almost immediately. Then 24 hours of her very nearly dying, Chrissy had begun having clonic movements on the right side of her body and face. The small spasms and twitches were like many seizures indicating trouble in her brain. Chrissy suffered no head injuries, but she had basically bled out, a condition that wreaks havoc within the body's chemistry. She had also stopped breathing for a period of time. 
By that afternoon, she was no longer able to respond with any consistency to verbal commands. Dr. Bruce Becker felt she had had a stroke on the left side of her brain. Whatever Chrissy could remember and share about the shooting would have to wait indefinitely. After Christy Downs had her stroke, she was appointed a speech therapist because her speech was affected. After that, gradually and gently, the therapist began to questioning her about her home life and the night of the shooting. Christy remembered going to Heather Pillard's and she remembered that she was in the car, a new one, had it had been red. She recalled that her mother would slap her in the face, would spank Danny on the bottom, and would slap Cheryl on the face. She wouldn't answer as to whether or not she wanted to live with her mother, but did admit she believed the shooting had happened because she was a bad girl. On June 22nd, following five weeks of treatment, Christy left the hospital to live with a trusted foster family. Danny would be placed with the same foster family on September 8th, two days after Christy started third grade. Both children began receiving counseling from a psychiatrist. With Diane's consent at the hospital, detectives later searched her duplex on Q Street. They were surprised to see moving boxes still stacked and unpacked throughout the two-floor unit as if the occupants had arrived a day or so ago. There was no dining room set, no kitchen table for the children to sit at. The refrigerator had very little in it, and what was there was covered with mold. The living room had only a console TV and one chair. Several photos were placed on top of the television. And they were of Diane, and two were of a dark-headed, bearded man. There were no pictures of the children anywhere in the house. The detectives did notice Diane's diary, a spiral notebook full of her writings. She had asked for it to be brought to her at the hospital. Considering that it might be evidence, it was copied before being delivered to Diane. The diary provided a wealth of information about Diane and her life. Detectives learned that she had been a surrogate mother after watching an episode of Phil Donahue television show. Although she had flunked the Kentucky Clinic psychological evaluation twice with those doctors believing she had histrionic personality disorder and the earmarks of a psychopathology, which could mean that she was merely quirky or she suffered from psychosis. She was eventually approved and inseminated. Diane had written of her surrogate pregnancy, that baby birth, and the child being turned over to the parents. Many of Diane's diary entries had to do with her day-to-day -day life, from the trivial details of a letter carrier dotted with comments from men who found her attractive to her menstrual cycle. Her words sounded more like those of a teenage girl instead of an adult woman, especially when she talked about a man named Robert Knickerbocker and who went by the nickname Nick. Nick was a postal carrier in Chandler, Arizona. He had begun an affair with Diane on July of 1982. Diane had noted the exact date in her diary. He was married, but he and his wife were having problems and Diane seemed to be a needed distraction. According to Nick, he never meant the affair with Diane to be anything other than a fling. Nick's wife, Charlene, had known about the affair almost as soon as it started. She bided her time, waiting for her husband to end it. For the next nine months, Nick went back and forth between Diane and Charlene. Diane rented an apartment for herself and Nick. He never moved in. She got a tattoo of a huge rose with his name underneath. In February of 1983, she pushed too hard and Nick told her he loved Charlene more than he loved her. In anger, she had put in a transfer from Chandler to Springfield, Oregon, where her parents resided. Diane had apparently believed that the request would scare Nick and send him running back to her. Even after she had packed up and arrived in Oregon, she still held to the hope that Nick would leave Charlene and follow her northwest. Once Diane left Arizona, though, Nick felt more clear-headed and realized he didn't want to move to Oregon and he didn't want to be with Diane. He wanted to stay with his wife. He refused Diane's mail and her phone calls. As far as he was concerned, it was officially over. Even after the end of their relationship in April of 1983, Diane continued to write Nick. 
She wrote about missing him and missing his body and missing his conversations and even writing about how it would be when he finally did arrive in Oregon. Although she considered herself Nick's woman and was fooling herself that he was going to leave Charlene, his wife, and Arizona for her, it didn't stop her from starting other sexual relationships with men in Oregon. The first being within seven days of her arriving in Springfield. One thing the detectives did note was that Diane rarely if ever wrote about Christy, Cheryl, or Danny other than to mention that they too miss Nick. Something Nick would later dispute as he said they barely knew him and they were never home when he was there. And that is until May the 11th, 1983, eight days before the shooting, suddenly the focus in Diane's diary was about her children. As if she had just discovered that she had children, she spoke of them as fantastic, smart, and sweet. The four of them were the four musketeers, and Diane now believes she loved them more than she loved Nick. Or maybe it was just her plan to kill them, and she had to document it in her diary, I'm just saying. Diane had been readmitted to the hospital in early June to have surgery for her injured arm where a single bullet had shattered her radius. Both Christy and Danny were still in the hospital at that time. Diane had visited them daily, but the state was working to have custody removed from her. Investigator Kurt Worst took the opportunity while Diane was under sedation to speak to Danny. The little boy was in a wheelchair and didn't understand why he couldn't stand up and walk. Danny told Worst that he remembered going to Heather Pallard's and that he sat in the back seat of the car with Christy. He remembered seeing Christy get hurt, that she didn't cry, and she had been hurt in the arm. He admitted he was afraid to talk about it and not supposed to answer. At that time, the staff were suspicious at the hospital because Diane seemed unmoved. She was very calm and confident in what she was saying. She didn't seem to be emotional at, at all, even though her three children had been shot. The hospital staff even said that she was laughing and smiling. When she was told about Christie's injuries, Diane said to the doctors if she has or seems to have any kind of any kind of brain damage and just let her die. Really? When I was finished taking care of Christy, then I sought out her mother and to my complete surprise Diane was non emotional, not a tear in her eye. And then she says that really ruined my new car. I got blood all over the back of it. I've never seen a reaction like that at all. But if the hospital staff was suspicious before, when Diane Downs entered the room of her daughter that time, they knew something was wrong. Christy was petrified of Diane Downs. Although the police had wanted to arrest Diane by the summer of 1983, they chose to wait for Christy to be well enough to recount what had happened that night in May. It would take many months. The detective found after interviewing Steve Downs and Robert Knickerbocker that Diane did indeed own a 22 pistol, the same type of gun that had been used in the shootings. They were unable to locate the gun but did find unfired casings in her home with the gun markings. Dr. John Mackey would go on to tell investigators that based on the angle of the children's wounds, he felt the shooter had probably stood near the driver's door but no blood spatter or gunpowder residue was found on the driver's door or the door's interior. Investigators speaking with Downs' former neighbors in Arizona were told that Cheryl had often had been dressed improperly for the weather and would knock on their doors claiming she was hungry. Her mother would go out, leaving then the six-year-old Christy in charge of both Cheryl and their toddler boy, Danny. Christy had been responsible not only for babysitting, but for cooking, doing the dishes, and the family laundry. One neighbor recalled pulling Cheryl out of the way of a car in the street and scolding her. The little girl had said it wouldn't have mattered if she had gotten struck by the car. Another told the sad tale of Cheryl saying that she wanted to shoot herself with a gun. A neighbor of Wes and Willa Dean Fredrickson in Oregon told Detective Roy Pond that she had met Cheryl the day before the little girl had died. 
Cheryl had told the woman that she was afraid of her mother, who had jumped out from behind a tree in the park to scare her. Bad enough that her life had ended early and so brutally, but apparently her seven years had not been good ones. No one in the DA's office, especially Fred Hughey, believed that there had been an aggressor on Old Mohawk Road. Investigator Paul Alton, Hughey's central fact finder, summed up his and the investigator's misgiving. I don't buy it. She goes out to Sunderman to see Heather Pollard. She decides to go sightseeing and heads toward Marcola. Suddenly she decides she'll veer off onto Old Mohawk Road. Say we buy the story that she's sightseeing. Even if it's almost pitch dark, she's sightseeing. To the trained eyes, the picture was incorrect, incomplete, even retouched. If the killer wanted the car, wouldn't he have just shot the driver, Diane, first? She was the adult and would have been his biggest obstacle, not the three tiny kids huddling in the car. What would a bushy-haired stranger have to gain in shooting Christy, Cheryl, and Danny down? During that time, forensic scientist James Peck from the Oregon State Police Department had examined the interior of Down's automobile to produce some thoughtful findings. As reported to Hughey and his squad, Peck had found a couple of 22 caliber U-shell copper casings ejected after firing the pistol. No bullet had penetrated the body of the car indicating that all the bullets between the children they suffered five bullet wounds had hit their mark. Not one of the bullets fired had missed. Blood smeared the side door and the front seat where Cheryl had tumbled after being shot and pools of blood stained the rear seat where Danny and Chrissy had been hit. But Peck surprised no blood at all on the driver's side, no smears on the steering wheel, if the bullet had hit Diane as she was getting into her car, as she said, it would have been reflex for her to grab that wound with her idle hand. There would have been blood on that hand. Then as she tried to steer her car from the scene, blood would have been on the steering wheel. Diane went on several news programs to profess her innocence, which made her look even more guilty. Police waited and strategically gathered evidence against her. Police found when they examined Diane's house, the three pictures on top of her television stand are only of Diane. Also, one of the things that the police find is a unicorn which appears to be a kind of memorial to the children that has their names on it and, the, and a date on it. But surprisingly, this wasn't something that Diane came to acquire after the attack. It is something that was already there before the attack even happened. So she memorialized her children even before they were attacked. Diane Down's children, the police believe, became the obstruction to what she wanted. She wanted this great love affair. Then she needs to get rid of her children because her lover does not want children. It finally came down in February of 1984. A secret grand jury handed down indictments against Diane for two counts of assault in the first degree, two counts of attempted murder, and one count of murder. On the evening of February 27th, Diane, who had been moved back into her parents' home following the shooting, had a huge blow up with her father, Wes, who had ordered her out of the house she had no friends and nowhere to go other than a local bar where she remained until closing. She then slept in her car. On the morning of February 28th, as she drove into Cottage Grove Post Office, police were waiting for her. She was taken into custody without incident. The police also found a 22 caliber rifle in the house and their hopes were peak during that time. When officers conducted a search warrant on Diane Downs' house, they pulled a .22 caliber rifle from under Diane Downs' bed in her residence. Then later, investigator Jim Peck did a comparison using a microscope. He compared the cartridges from the rifle that came out of Diane Downs' house from the cartridge casings from her car at the crime scene 
and they were identical, meaning the bullets used to shoot Diane's kids came from her house. If you're going to commit murder, don't leave evidence in your house. I'm just saying. This is when the police knew we've got her. Checking sales records, police knew that Diane Downs had owned a Ruger 22 semi-automatic pistol, but it was never found, for Diane Downs managed to dispose of the gun. Nine months after the crime, Diane was brought into custody. She appeared at Lane County Courthouse for her arraignment after the charges were read, Diane Downs revealed a major surprise. Her attorney stands up and after he's finished all his legal arguments and says, your honor, my client is pregnant and would be bad for her health if she went to jail. When everybody in the court heard this, you could hear a pin drop. You could hear the entire courtroom take a big deep breath as if shocked just absolutely shocked. According to the rumors, the father was a local reporter who had sex with her and she became pregnant from that. The great attention seeker, Diane Downs, loved to be the center of attention. And by the time the trial began on May 8, 1984, Downs was eight months pregnant and this was something that she thought would help her garner quite a bit of sympathy. On June 6, Diane got a hearing questioning the state's right to remove Christy and Danny from her custody. It would be the first Diane would appear in the media. Both she and the press realized the camera loved Diane Downs. She lost the custody hearing, meaning that essentially she would have to make an appointment to see her own children. But she found a new lover, the camera and the viewing audience. Danny cried the whole way. I could hear him softly just moaning. Christy was dying. God, the, all the blood, all the pain. Emotionally, she was flat. I kept trying to tell detached. her she ran over so she wouldn't choke on the blood. And it didn't dawn on me at the time that the blood was coming from her lungs. Her behavior was not anything that you would expect for uh, a mother who'd gone through this. To the press, she was a victim, a mother who was in pain after losing one child and whose two livings were injured children were being withheld from her. Diane continued to give press conferences criticizing the investigation and the police who had not yet found the bushy-haired stranger who had shot her children. If I had shot my own children, would I not have done a good job of it? Why would I have taken my kids to the hospital? Wouldn't I have made sure they were dead and then cried crocodile tears? That's insane to think that I would do such a thing and then bring the, the witnesses in against myself. That's crazy. I'm here just to appeal for people out there, to, if they know anything, to call in. She didn't believe that Danny's paralysis would be permanent. According to Diane, she could love her son into walking again. Fred Hugie had worked for a successful private practice. He was interested in the legal system and how it should work, and so left private practice to join the district attorney, which is how he became the prosecutor for Diane Downs' case. Fred hated publicity and the media, and the Downs case would have submerged him in both. By 1973, the same year that Steve and Diane Downs married, Fred had a nice living working as a defense attorney in a private practice, while Joe and his wife worked for a university, both workaholics. They made a conscious decision not to have children as they believed children deserved attention they couldn't provide. The State of Oregon versus Elizabeth Diane Downs proved to be the biggest story to hit Oregon in many years. Expecting large crowds, the trial was moved to courtroom three, the largest in Lane County Courthouse. Even so, it couldn't accommodate the many spectators and the press as cameras were not allowed in the courtroom. A handful of sketch artists were present. The jury was comprised of nine women and three men would not be sequestered as Lane County could not afford to put them in a hotel for a trial. 
expected to last a month. Nearly a year after the shooting on May 8th of 1984, the, the trial against Elizabeth Diane Downs began before Judge Gregory Foote. Wearing a blue maternity dress with a lacy white collar, Diane appeared to be very sympathetic defendant. In fact, many of the courtroom spectators were housewives who were either desperate to support her or desperate to find out if she really did it. In a trial that lasted 31 days, the evidence against Diane appeared insurmountable. Her antics, however, was not enough to fool the jury. A mountain of evidence went a long way to convincing them of Diane's, Diane Downs' culpability in the crime. Then her surviving daughter, Christy, took the stand. The little girl had to have been under so much strain. Her mother has tried to kill her. She's living with a new family. Her sister is dead. Her brother's in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. And now she has to sit in front of a room full of strangers and talk about the most difficult night of her life. She gets up on the stand and when the attorney asks her the question, who shot you? Your siblings, she says, Nobody dares breathe. Christy laid out how her mother first shot Cheryl, then turned and shot Danny in the back, and then shot her twice in the chest. The testimony just tore your heart apart. And this wasn't a critical piece of information. There was lots of physical evidence of what Diane Downs had done. But I think this was the essential in making sure that Diane Downs was convicted of the crime she committed. The forensic evidence did not match Diane's story. There was no blood on the driver's side of the car, nor was there any gunpowder residue on the driver's panel. Downs did not tell police that she owned a 22 caliber handgun, but both Steve, her ex-husband, and Robert Nickenbacher, her ex-lover, said she did own one. Outside of Diane herself and Christy Downs, perhaps the most whispered about anticipated witness was Robert Nick Knickerbocker, who took the stand to recount the details of his affair with Diane while his wife Charlene sat in the gallery. Nick Knickerbocker, the man whom Diane Downs killed for, also reported to police that Downs had stalked him and seemed, and seemed willing to kill his wife if it meant that she could have him. He would testify for hours about the many letters Diane wrote him and phone calls she had made to him. And when asked, he said he barely saw Christy, Cheryl, and Danny. According to Diane, they basically took care of themselves. It was the kids he used in part to finally break things off with Diane after she had begun pressuring him to divorce Charlene. He told Diane that he didn't want kids. He never wanted to be a father. Knickerbocker stated that he was relieved that Diane had left for Oregon and he was able to reconcile with his wife. Steve Downs also took the stand to go through his tortured history with his ex-wife. From their affairs to Diane's surrogate pregnancies to Danny not being his biological son. He testified that he was guilty of beating Diane in the past but also that she had tried to shoot him twice back in 1982. Hardly squeaky clean, Steve admitted that he had been convicted of grand theft auto and was guilty of insurance fraud, a scheme that he claimed Diane had dreamt up. He also said that Diane owned several guns and was very familiar with how to shoot them. The most detrimental witness for Diane, other than Diane herself, was Christy. Only nine years old, suffering with a speech impediment due to the trauma from the shooting, and with her right arm still paralyzed, the frightened little girl took the stand four days shy of exactly a year after being rushed into the ER near death. She and Diane had locked eyes when Christy entered the courtroom. Christy remembered very clearly the events of May 9, 1983. She recalled visiting Heather Pollard and then getting in the car to go home. 
She and Danny were sitting in the back seat and Cheryl was in the front passenger seat. Diane also claims that Cheryl had been asleep when the shooting occurred, but Christy recalled that Cheryl was awake and talking. Christy remembered the car pulling to the side of the road and stopping and her mother getting out. She remembered no one else being there but her mother her brother, and her sister. She remembered her mother going to the back of the car where the trunk was, lifting the trunk and getting something out. Christy began to cry as she recounted when the shooting started. Diane returned to the car, leaned across the front seat and shot Cheryl before leaning over the back seat to shoot Danny. A witness saw Downs's car being driven very slowly toward the hospital at an estimated speed of 5 to 10 miles per hour, contradicting Down's claim that she drove to the hospital at a high speed after the shooting. All of the doctors that had worked feverishly to save the lives of Christy, Cheryl, and, and Danny Downs testify as to the children's injuries and treatment. Dr. Steve Wilhite recalled that Diane, after asking how Christy was, stated that she knew that Chrissy had suffered brain damage and did not want her life sustained. In Dr. Wilhite's opinion, such an instruction was unusual and inappropriate as Chrissy had not shown any signs of brain damage. Heather Pillar testified that Diane and her children left her house that night on May 19, 1983 at 9.45 p.m. and that Diane had told her she was worried that Christy might blame Diane for the shooting because when Christy raised up in her hospital room, the first person she saw was Diane Downs. A man named Joseph Inman testified that on the evening of May 19, 1983, he had been driving down Old Mohawk Road and had gotten behind a red sports car with an Arizona plate. The car had been going so slowly that his own speedometer had dropped down to less than 10 miles an hour due to the winding road. He had been forced to creep along behind the car for roughly two minutes. Inman said it was 10.15 p.m. and when he got be behind the red car, when he was able to go around, it was 10.17 when he passed it. As he did, no one in the car motioned for help, honked their horn, or flashed their lights, and Emming continued on his way. He identified a photo of Diane's red Nissan Pulsar as the car he had seen. Diane's attorney attempted to sway Inman on the time and the speed, when he, but he would not budge. The prosecution pointed out to the jury that at the time Joseph Inman passed Diane's car, she was only four miles from the hospital, yet it took her another 22 minutes to reach the ER. They also stressed that in her recounting of events, she told investigators that after she and the children had been shot, she had jumped in her car and driven as fast as she could to the hospital. Many defendants facing murder charges elect not to take the stand and give testimony, which is their right. Diane Downs, however, wanted to testify and tell her story of what really happened because she can't shut up. Although clearly very intelligent, she was no match for Fred Hughey, who had been waiting for the chance to question her and bring up her contradictions. Under questioning from her own attorney, Jim Jager, Diane testified about the molestation she had suffered at the hands of her father as if that's an excuse for murder her abusive marriage to Steve, and how her children gave her the purest love she had ever known. She admitted that she laughed at inappropriate times, but said it was due to being nervous. She loved Nick, yes, but she said he was a lot of work and a lot of trouble, and she would never choose her him over her own children. And yes, her children were handicapped, but she wanted them back. According to Diane, she put the children first. Yes, she was asked about going to work the next morning of the shooting, but she said she never missed work. Yes, she blamed the hospital for Danny's paralysis. She believed a nurse intentionally paralyzed him by picking him up, and she hoped that nurse would burn. Finally, Diane testified about her version of the shooting, contradicting Heather Pillard's testimony. Diane said that she and the kids left at 9.50 p.m. 
five minutes later than Heather claimed. While sightseeing, she said she pulled off the road to debate where to go. She said that she and the Cheryl had a chat before Cheryl curled up on the floorboard to go to sleep. According to Diane, Danny and Christy were also asleep in the back seat, but she remained parked for a while. She had remembered that she needed to buy school lunch tickets for the next week and got her checkbook to look it over. Diane did not cry, recounting the bushy-haired stranger flagging her down and then shooting her children. There's nothing I can do about it now, she said when her attorney noted Jager asked her point blank if she shot her children. No, I did not, she replied. Shugi had waited for a year to cross-examine Diane Downs, and he was ready. He had Diane Downs' diary, those spiral notebooks with, with pages and pages of writing in evidence, and they contradicted that she felt Nick was a headache and not worth the effort. Her own words demonstrated the, obses the obsessive love she felt for him, and it seemed that her children were the headache and not worth the effort. Hughie started his examination slowly, gently, and stealthily. In his cross, her disdain for men in general was very evident. When she was shopping for a sperm donor for the children that would end up being Danny, she chose Steve's co-worker because he was nice. She gave no concern as to the feelings on becoming a father. She admitted that she flirted with everyone she worked with and condescendingly offered to make Hughie a list of one of her lovers to make it easier for him. She denied that Nick was any more special or or the emotional intensity any greater than any other man she had ever been with. She said he was the only one stupid enough to tell his wife. When Hughie questioned Diane about the night of the shooting, remained firm but calm. Diane was weary and snappy. He couldn't understand why a man intent on stealing her car would shoot the children and would shoot the children inside and then still want it. Diane explained the actions of an insane man could not be explained. Diane couldn't explain why she later told detectives that two men were involved in the shooting, had addressed her by name. Huyugi closed his examination of her bringing up her physical abuse of the children. She said she hadn't been abusive to them in two years before the shooting and asked her if she had ever grabbed Christy by the throat. She denied it, but her raise at such a question was evident to everyone in the courtroom. A psychiatrist who testified during the trial said that Elizabeth Diane Downs suffered from with narcissistic, histrionic, and antisocial personality disorders. Both the defense and the prosecution called other witnesses to support their side of the case. It was June 11, six weeks into the trial, when final arguments were finally given. Fred Hughie spoke first, stressing to the jury that Diane shot her children in order to win back Robert Knickerbocker, who had clearly told her that he did not want her, did not want to be a father.
does she look at her mother after seeing her sister in the rubber shop? Here comes mom with a seat with a gun. Put her in a shot. Her hand goes up. Stop. Another shot. This is the last shot. He asked them to remember Joseph Inman's testimony who had come up on the scene of the shooting only a minute or so after it happened and had testified to seeing no stranger, no yellow car, and, almost in, and most importantly, he had followed the red Nissan that was going painfully slow, driving straight and precise, and not asking for help. It had taken Diane 18 minutes to go eight-tenths of a mile. Jugi asked them to remember Diane's own testimony and most importantly to remember that of Christy Downs who had recalled the shooting in great detail and who identified her own mother as the shooter. Nine-year-old Christy who had not only miraculously survived the attempt on her life but who told her psychiatrist that Diane had not loved her Cheryl or Danny, but only loved Nick. Hughie's closing argument lasted all day on June 11, and so Diane attorney Jim Jaker faced the jury on June the 12th. He did his best to attack the points that Fred Hughie had brought up, suggesting that Christy was mistaken in identifying her mother as the shooter. He did not dispute that Joseph Inman was behind the Downs' car and the Downs was going slowly, but said it was doing so because Diane was trying to get Christy to roll over so she wouldn't choke, was putting the window down and was wrapping her arm with the beach towel. Jager ended his eight plus hour argument with criticisms of Robert Knickerbocker and of the investigation. And the next day on June the 12th, Fred Hughie again had a rebuttal. He told the jury that in order to find Diane not guilty, they would have to discount Christie's entire testimony. He went through the state's case and ended with the beach towel that Diane used to wrap around her arm, the one she claimed she grabbed frantically as she was driving. Bloodstains on the towel show exactly how the towel was wrapped, neatly folded corner to corner, making first a rectangular and then a triangle before it covered Diane's arm. This, Hughie said, was why none of Diane's blood was found in the car that was drenched with her children's blood. Diane had taken care to make sure she was looked after with a towel that was very likely was folded beforehand for that very purpose. If Diane and her children had been shot by a stranger, he explained, wouldn't she have just grabbed the towel and just pressed it against her arm quickly, but not neatly around her injured arm? Hughie left the jury with this visual before returning to the prosecution's table. The jury was given the case at 2.37 p.m. on Thursday, June 14th, Spectators debated whether the jury would return before the nine months old Diane went into labor, and the prosecution worried as each hour that ticked away that she would be acquitted. Ten of the twelve jurors could vote to acquit her of murder, but all twelve would have to convict her. Thursday and Friday passed by, and as this Saturday, it was just after midnight on Sunday, June 17th, 1984, Father's Day, when word circulated, no baby for Diane, but a verdict from the jury. Elizabeth Diane Downs was found guilty on all counts. Her sentencing hearing was on August 28th. Judge Gregory Foote, who had presided over the criminal trial, sentenced Diane to a total of life plus 50 years to be served consecutively. Judge Foote had worried that a future parole board would forget the enormity of Diane's crimes and told her 
The court hopes the defendant will never again be free. I've come as close to that as possible. Diane had found out during her trial that the baby she carried would not be hers if she was found guilty. Ten days after her conviction on June 22, 1984, she was taken to the hospital in Eugene where her labor was induced. None of her family was there for the birth of her fifth child, a little girl named Amy Elizabeth. Diane was permitted to hold the baby and spend time with her for four hours before the infant was taken from her and she was returned to prison. If anyone was destined to serve their time quietly, it wasn't Diane Downs. She continued to give interviews to whom whoever wanted to talk to her. This man shot my daughter. My first reaction was to snap back to my childhood, to the pain that had happened to me back then, my marriage, my entrapment by society. This man was bigger than me. He was stronger than me. He had more power because he had a gun. And I stood there and I looked at Christy reaching and the blood that just kept gushing out of her mouth. And, and I, what do you do? stressing her innocence and stating that she was fully expected to be released from prison once Christy remembered the actual truth. Three years after her conviction on June 11, 1987, Diane Downs escaped from an Oregon Women's Correctional Center in, in Salem, Oregon. Diane Downs walked into the unsupervised recreation yard of the prison and scaled an 18-foot razor wire fence sometime between 8 o'clock a.m. and 9 o'clock a.m. She then used her shirt to cover the razor wire and climbed over the fence. While she was climbing over the fence, she triggered an alarm system. She then ran along the gates of the prison and hid underneath a parked white truck to escape the guards who were unable to find her. The prison guards were too late to catch Diane but a, but a prison nurse saw Diane escaping and alerted the officials. While the guards were doing a head count to see who escaped, Diane ran to State Street and got a ride from a Salem woman. She told her that she had been in a car accident and that her boyfriend was injured and she needed to go to get help. She asked the woman to take her to a convenience store to get help. Diane made it to the convenience store, which was about a mile from the correctional facility. She then traveled by foot to a nearby town. By 9.30 a.m., one of the largest manhunts in Oregon history had begun. Salem, Marion County, and state police officers joined forces, police dispatch, air patrol as well. They also said that Diane Downs could be headed to a number of locations. Officers were posted near her two children, who had been adopted by Lane County District Attorney Fred Hughey. Christy and Danny Downs were monitored and watched closely in case Diane attempted to make contact with them to take them. And in Arizona, Robert and Charlene Knickerbocker worried that Diane might suddenly show up there. Diane Downs sightings were throughout Oregon and the Northwest. As everyone was on the lookout, it would be 10 days before she would be located, 10 days in which she could have fled across the country into Canada or Mexico or to parts unknown. Amazingly, she had been less than half a mile from the prison. Diane had the address of a former cellmate's husband who moved closer to the prison to be near his wife. Wayne Cipher was his name, and his wife was an inmate at the Oregon Women's Correctional Center, and they were separated and not on speaking terms. He only lived 10 blocks away. She simply walked to his home. Diane walked to the door and asked the man for a place to stay. Seducing the man by showing her breasts in exchange for a place to stay. They quickly had an affair for 10 days. Detective Doug Welsh said during that time, I was dumbfounded when I heard it. How can this happen? This was one of the most notorious female inmates in the state, and somehow she got over the wall and escaped. Larry Glover, the Oregon State Police detective who eventually found the key clue that would lead to Diane's arrest, Glover said that he feared Diane would go looking for her kids to potentially harm or kidnap them and said that the pressure to find her intensified once the escape 
caught the attention of the governor's office and the media. During that time, Downs was shacking up with Cypher, who had been living in the house with his two friends. He said we were kind of just living on the edge at that time. Cypher said, noting that he himself was addicted to her heroin at that time. On the morning Downs showed up, he said that he had a hangover and that Bob, his friend, came up to his room to tell him someone was downstairs who wanted to talk to him. So I walked downstairs, still a little bit bleary-eyed, and she said, could I stay? He said, why not, then walked back upstairs. Downs eventually introduced herself a couple of hours later, standing naked in front of him, and they had a sexual relationship while she was hiding out there. Cypher said he was a nervous wreck and was drunk the whole time. My only job was to keep her there, he said, keeping her from going out and harming anybody. He admitted he should have turned her in, but I didn't, he said. With none of the leads working out, four days after Downs escaped, a detective Glover went to the penitentiary to look at Downs' property, which had been collected in a cardboard box. Inside, he found clothes, a map of Mexico, and a clipboard with some stationery for writing on it. The stationery was blank, but when he looked at it against the light at an angle, Glover noticed indentations on the paper. They were remnants of a map that had been drawn onto the top of the paper. Glover discovered, after the FBI created a photostatic copy of it, this map, Glover said, had a line going from the top to the bottom, which he believed was State Street, the road where the prison was located. On the bottom left corner was a box he believed to be the prison, and on the top was an address of Cypher's home. Detective Glover wasn't there when the authorities raided Cypher's home looking for Downs. He was on vacation at the time. But on that day, over 40 officers stormed into the home and then to Cypher's bedroom to apprehend Elizabeth Diane Downs. Cypher said she was going to grab a BB gun and just go suicide by cop, but I said don't do that, and she put the BB gun down, and she went without a fight, turned her hands over and put her hands behind her back. Cypher said that he knew the police were eventually going to find Downs and that he'd get in trouble for it. When it came my time to burn, I was just going to tell the truth and get it over with, he said. He said he has been asked a million times why he didn't turn Diane Downs in and he says he still doesn't know the answer to that, other than it was his drug use. After her capture, Diane received an additional five-year sentence. She is currently incarcerated in Chochilla, California. Cypher pleaded guilty to hindering prosecution for harboring Diane Downs and sentenced to five years probation and six months in a restitution center in Salem. After her recapture, Diane Downs was transferred to the New Jersey Department of Corrections Clinton Correctional Facility for Women after heavy lobbying by Prosecutor Hughie. The Salem prison was located 66 miles from Hughie's home in Springfield. During her 10 days of freedom, Hughie had feared that Downs would attempt to travel there in hopes of contacting Christy and Danny. Despite significant security upgrades at the women's facility after the escape, state officials accepted Hughie's argument that the risk of harm to Christy and Danny in the event of another escape was too great for Downs to remain incarcerated in Oregon. While in prison, she earned an associate's degree in general studies. In 1994, after serving 10 years, Diane Downs was transferred to the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation in 2010. And Downs was relocated to the Valley State Prison for Women in Chochilla, California, but was transferred out when the facility was converted to an all-male institution in 2013. Downs' two surviving children eventually went to live with the lead prosecutor of the case, Fred Hughie. He and his wife, Joanne, adopted them in 1986. Christy Downs, her daughter who testified during her trial, suffers from a speech impediment, a speech disability. She has a son and a daughter whom she named Cheryl in memory of her late sister. Prior to her arrest, Downs became pregnant with a fifth child and gave birth to a girl whom she named Amy Elizabeth. A month after her 1984 trial, 
Ten days before down sentencing, Amy was seized by the state of Oregon and adopted by Chris and Jackie Babcock, who subsequently renamed her Rebecca Babcock. As an adult, Rebecca appeared on The Oprah Winfrey Show and ABC's 2020 where she discussed how she felt about her biological mother. Rebecca wrote to Downs in her younger years and has stated that she regrets the contact regarding her mother. Becky Babcock wrote her mother in prison, Diane Down. She wrote her letter saying, I don't know if you're going to believe me, but I could possibly be your biological daughter. Send her photographs and she nearly jumped out of her skin when Diane Downs wrote her back. Diane Downs wrote, You look like me. We have the same chin. Don't you hate it? Diane Downs didn't give her any answers, just a baffling mess of confusing details about her life. In all, six letters. Her paranoia and psychosis comes into full view from the very moment she starts writing. After Rebecca thought it over, she wrote back to her mother, I'm sorry, please stop writing me. She decided she did not want to know her mother, the murderer. Diane Downs wrote her back one final time and said, You are not my daughter. Author Anne Rule wrote the book Small Sacrifices in 1987, which detailed Downs' life in the murder trial. The book documents accounts by friends, acquaintances, and neighbors, and her surviving daughter, Christy, who questioned the quality of her parenting if you're interested in reading. A made-for-TV movie also titled Small Sacrifices starring Farrah Fawcett as Downs aired on ABC in 1989. that Diane Downs is a malignant narcissist. There is something especially sinister about a woman that would annihilate her family for a relationship. From looking at the life of Diane Downs, we can see who she is in full view, psychotic. The only thing that matters to Diane Downs is Diane Downs. She murdered her own child in order to keep her lover. Her surviving children, Christy Danny and Rebecca Babcock, want nothing to do with her. She, she should never, under any circumstances, ever be allowed to walk freely in these streets. Whether she was molested or not by her father, something sinister went wrong with her from a very early age. Based on her comments and accusations and molestation by her father, whether it is untrue or not, who knows what happens behind closed doors. Her hatred of men is clearly profound during interview shows. She used sex as a tool to get what she wanted. All she wanted was attention. Like I said, the only thing that matters to Diane Downs is Diane Downs. Thank God little Christy had the courage and strength to stand up to her in the end, to put her behind bars where she belongs. Thank you for watching. This is Notorious Minds. Please like and share and by all means subscribe to this channel. We look forward to seeing you here next time. Be safe out there and have a great day.